the first line result is that men and women performed equally well on average. In fact, if you look across all of our subjects, women performed maybe a half a question better, but the men rated themselves much more favorably on all of these scales. Uh, and so on the zero to 100 scale, men gave themselves ratings that were 25% higher than the ratings that women gave themselves. Welcome to The Ripple Effect, the podcast that takes you on a journey through the minds of work and faculty. I'm your host, Dan Loney, and in each episode, we'll be diving deep into the inspiration behind the groundbreaking research that Wharton professors have conducted and exploring how their findings resonate with the world today. We'll be covering a diverse range of topics, bringing you the latest insights and knowledge that you can apply to your life and to work. So get ready to dive into new ideas with the ripple effect. So Judd, the annual performance review is a thing that uh, a lot of people dread. What was it that led you to study this topic in the first place? Yeah, we were very interested in a question that economists in particular had not really studied that much, which is how do people subjectively describe their performance? It's one thing uh, to answer a question like, how, ma how many uh, units did you sell this year? Or how many new clients did you sign on? But a lot of communication about performance uh, and ability, so even before you join a, a job, maybe you're asked about you know, how good you are at something. A lot of the communication around that is subjective. You, you, there's no right answer. You have to describe something that's kind of hard to pin down. And economists had not really looked at that, but we think that it's something that's quite important in the way people perceive you. And so we wanted to really look at that style of question, being asked something subjective about ability or performance. And apparently your research showed to a degree that women systematically rate themselves lower than men on work performance, even when their work may be viewed as being objectively better. Can you account for the difference there? So this was one of the things that motivated us to subjective questions and the way people answered them. Because we had this hypothesis that not only is this important and understudied, but it's something that we might see a gender gap where men conditional on the same performance, men would describe that performance more favorably. So uh, my co-author on this work is Christine Exley at Harvard Business School. And you know, she and I wrote, wrote this paper. And if you asked us about the same paper, I might say, oh, it's phenomenal. And she might say, oh, you know, it's pretty good. And that difference of the way that we talk about the work, even though it's the same underlying project that we're, we're both a part of, that was the kind of dynamic that we thought might be interesting to explore. So when you talk about the office, are there subtle ways that, that this might show up more so than not? So we were interested not just in the performance reviews that, you know, you might get asked once a year where the employer will sit you down and, and kind of work through a set of questions. We were also interested in the kinds of more commonplace and, and often sometimes subtle interactions that you have with your colleagues and with your supervisors where you're just talking about work and, and people are getting an impression of how well you do your job and whether you might be able to take on more difficult challenges. And if men systematically talk about their prior performance and their underlying ability in more positive terms, that might change the way that people perceive them relative to their equally capable female, female colleagues. And so that was uh, the kind of what pushed us a little bit more towards these more subjective questions and the ways in which people typically communicate that is, you know, with adjectives or uh, we, we still were economists who wanted to study this. We still had quantitative questions. So we asked things like, how much would you agree with the statement I performed well uh, on a zero to 100 scale? So we can still get a quantitative measure, but it's clearly a subjective question that doesn't have a correct answer. Is the potential impact for women having this difference at times noticeable? Yeah, so it's a little tricky because what we don't want to do is say that women should necessarily self-promote more, that, that they should necessarily talk more favorably about their own performance. They are in a situation where it's possible that there will be backlash and perhaps differential backlash 
uh, for speaking too positively about their own uh, ability and performance. It's possible that the gender difference that we observe is in fact a response to kind of social training that people go through where when they do talk favorably about how well they did, you know, that they might be met with kind of harsher uh, responses. And so they've kind of learned not to not to push it on those adjectives. So the study that we did, which I'm excited to tell you more about, took away the possibility for backlash. So the there wasn't anyone who was going to respond to what the su the subjects in our study said uh, in a necessarily a negative way. In fact, they didn't even know if there was anyone responding. They didn't know the gender of the person. Um, but it doesn't mean that those same forces weren't influencing the way that men and women talked about how well they did. So the advice is not to the women or the men about how they talk about themselves. Any takeaways from the research uh, have to be on how we elicit information about people's uh, performance and ability and, and potentially not relying so much on the way people talk about themselves. All right. So take us through the research a little bit and what you were able to decipher. Yeah. So this, uh, this was a project I was really excited to be a part of, and it uh, ended up with a lot of parts. But the first thing we, we did was we had uh, our study subjects. Uh, so there were about 4,000 of them who were recruited from an online labor market platform. Uh, and then I'll tell you about some youth that we uh, did a similar version of the study with. Uh, I'll tell you about that later. But the uh, 4,000 folks, the first thing they did was they took a math and science test. So 20 questions taken from the Armed Services Vocational Aptitude Battery Test, which is a, a test that is used by folks like me as measure of cognitive ability. Um, but the questions we picked were, were math and science questions. The subjects took that test. And then we asked them, you know, how well did you think you did on the kind of normal out of 20 questions? You know, tell me the number that you think you got correct. And that's something that economists have looked at for a while. Uh, sort of just we call it we think of it as confidence of how, how many questions you, you got correct. Then we asked our subjective questions. So describing the performance on the test with a, an adjective that range from you know, very poor to exceptional. And uh, also these questions on the zero to 100 scale of agreement with statements like, I performed well on the test I took. What we found was that this, the first line result is that men and women performed equally well on average. In fact, if you look across all of our subjects, women performed maybe a half a question better. But the men rated themselves much more favorably on all of these scales. Uh, and so on the zero to 100 scale, men gave themselves ratings that were 25% higher than the ratings that women gave themselves. So the first hypothesis that we had was maybe this is just uh, confidence, just re-manifesting. So we looked at that question of how, uh, how many of the 20 questions that you got asked did you get correct? And sure enough, even though men and women on average each got about 10 questions correct, men said they got 11 correct and women said they got eight correct. So there was clear, clear evidence that uh, men and women had different perceptions of their uh, underlying ability. Um, and we wondered whether that was what was causing the gender gap in self-promotion. So what we did then was we told men and women after they took the test, we told them exactly how many questions they got correct. So now we're comparing men and women, say who each answered 10 questions correctly and have been told that they answered 10 questions correctly. And we asked the same questions about uh, you know, stating agreement with, I performed well on the test. And even with the same performance and knowing they had the same performance, there was still a very large gender gap. So the gender gap shrinks a little bit when you give performance information, but, it, but just a little bit, it's still quite big. And so that told us there's something beyond just the not being sure how many questions they got correct. There's something fundamentally different about the way men and women interpret the same underlying score. But the challenge, I think, in terms of giving that self-review, that self-evaluation that I think in many cases is probably a very unique element for people to have to do in general, whether they be men or women. So this was uh, one of the kind of hypotheses that we had, and we wanted to push the result that I just described a little bit further. So we did a few different things. One thing we did was we told men and women 
the average self-evaluations of other people who had scored the same as them. So now the men and women both know they answered 10 questions correctly and are now both told what the average self-evaluation is of folks who get 10 questions correct. Still, we see the gender gap. It's unchanged from that. So we had another hypothesis, which is maybe women just have higher standards than men. Maybe, you know, it, it's just the case that if you ask a woman how a certain score is, that they just kind of always think that it's, it's less good than, than a man would. So to get at this, uh, we did two things. Uh, both, I think, are informative. One thing we did was we asked people not to describe their own performance, but we asked them to describe somebody else's performance. So now you've taken the test. You, you don't know that you've answered 10 questions correct, but we're going to uh, look at folks, say, who men and women who both answered 10 questions correctly, and we're going to ask them to describe the performance of somebody else who answered 10 questions correctly. So it's their performance. They don't know it's their performance. Um, but now it's not about themselves, it's about somebody else. When we do that, we see no gender gap. So when describing a, a third party, men and women have the same, use the same adjectives for the same score. It's only when they're talking about their own performance that men and women differ. The other thing we did was, and this is based on research from economics and other fields, suggesting that gender gaps are related to the kind of stereotypes surrounding the task. So the unfortunate stereotype around math and science tasks is that they're kind of more male, we call a male type, that men are expected to do better than women, even though in our case, of course, women do, do better than men. Uh, but we picked a task that is less male type, that's kind of more neutral, and if anything, uh, folks think that women might outperform men, and that was a verbal task. So same kind of setup, but instead of doing a test with 20 math and science questions, uh, the subjects are doing a uh, test with verbal questions. And when we do that, we again see no gender gap in the way that men and women talk about their uh, performance when the performance is equally good. So the thing that's happening here is that there's something unique about this kind of math and science domain where the stereotype is that men do better, where in that domain only, women are saying that they do less well, even knowing that they have you know, a particular performance and that that performance is the same as a man who says they did great. So going back to what you said a couple of moments ago, I think it brings up the topic of self-promotion and how we think about how we are answering questions and how we view our perception of how we're doing in comparison to what we believe our colleagues may be doing as well. And I'm wondering if there is a potential concern of whether or not there can be too much self-promotion for either men or women. Yeah, so it's hard to get at this because, I mean, there certainly could be. And that's uh, earlier when I was talking about backlash that, um, you know, maybe women don't say that they're phenomenal in math and science because they're worried uh, that doesn't fit stereotypes of women and people will kind of react negatively to them saying that they're uh, that they're very good at this. And, and in fact, there is a lot of evidence of backlash uh, for actions that are not that don't fit stereotypes uh, that could, you know, could be playing out here as well. So there's certainly that element. I think, you know, it's not obvious without more research about exactly where the line is for kind of what the what's the appropriate amount of uh, positivity to have about you know how much can you uh, maybe overinflate your your own sense of self. I will say one other thing, one other set of studies that we did uh, to kind of start to think about this. We in, in much of what I've described, the uh, person who was answering the questions about how well they did these subjective questions, we told them that their uh, perform that sorry their their answer to the self promotion questions these subjective questions would be given to another study subject who would use that answer and only that answer so they wouldn't learn about how well the person actually performed they would use the self promotion answer to decide whether to hire the person and how much to pay them so that's where the self promotion kind of language comes from because this is an answer to a question that could be used to determine your your pay from the study. Well, and, and that was going to be part of my question next, because I think you also have to look at this from the uh, 
employer's perspective and how they understand these differences in the process of hiring and promotion through a company. Yeah, so that's uh, one of the things that I found interesting about the the different versions that we did because when the uh, study s- subjects knew that the employer would see the self-evaluation that they gave about their own performance, uh, they rated themselves more favorably. So they did respond to the fact that there was an incentive uh, to, to say that they did well. But when we took the employer incentive away, we still saw a big gender gap. So men and women, both of them were kind of inflating how they describe themselves in the presence of an employer when the employer was removed. So when they're just describing themselves to us, the experimenter, they still, they, they both come down and level, but there's still a massive gap. So this to me says, for the employer perspective, it's not about exactly the way that you incentivize the self-promotion questions that's going to matter. It's not like you can say, oh, we're asking these questions, but you know, we promise not to use them to determine bonus, or you know, we're, we're only going to use them in, in certain ways. It's not going to, removing the incentives to promote is not necessarily going to change the gender gap, which was there even absent the, the employer at all. It really is something about the way that people describe their their ability and performance, even when you know it's not being used for anything. It's just you know they they're just saying it to us, the researcher. So, can you theorize what might be the way for women to be able to close that gender gap a little bit? So, our takeaway is that well, it's twofold. One. We think it's not the responsibility of the women. It shouldn't be the responsibility of the women to change the way that they act for multiple reasons. One, it's it's unfair to put it on them. Two, uh, it's not clear that we know how to help people change the way they think about their own ability and performance. Oh, one result I didn't tell you that speaks to that is the study on youth. So uh, we did a, a study with 10,000 middle and high school students where we had them do ex- essentially the same thing, except we uh, did it without employers and we did it with a uh, shorter math and science test. And we saw gender gaps in the way that people talked about their ability and performance in every grade uh, that we looked at from uh, as young as sixth grade all the way up to, um, to, to seniors. And that was pretty, uh, pretty clear evidence to us that this was not something that, you know, was, was coming at a particular point in time. This was something that, uh, you know, seemed to be throughout at least middle school and high school, uh, this pattern. Um, so if, if there is intervention to be done, it might need to happen before sixth grade. Um, so that's the second thing is that it's not clear how we would change the way people perceive their own ability and performance. And then third is the thing I've mentioned already, which is the potential for backlash. So uh, it's not clear that we want to encourage women to promote more because that could, uh, you know, that could they, they could be optimizing given the incentives that they face. What that means then is that it pushes the 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 kind of fixing the problem back to the employers who at interview stages, uh, at application stages at the performance review stages, you know, we would argue should rely less on these subjective self-evaluations and should rely more on objective measures to the extent that they exist in assessing ability and performance. So where do you think the next step in this research is? Where do you want to take this next? Yeah, so uh, we are starting to think more about how the social dynamics of say the workplace or in educational institutions, how that uh, interacts with the gender gap. So one thing that we started to look at in our research was whether people perceive the gender gap. So whether I anticipate that women are going to talk less favorably about their own ability and performance. And it does not look like the study subjects who are participating. So the people who are giving us the answers that display the gap they don't appear to anticipate that the gap is there. So that doesn't answer a key question, which is do employers who are doing the hiring and promotion and deciding on bonuses, whether they've kind of learned over time that uh, that women kind of talk differently about their performance. It, it's possible that good employers have recognized that if they ask this question, they get the, the gender gap 
uh, and and maybe they even correct for it to a certain extent. But but that I think is the next line of work to figure out is that observation there and are the corrections actually being made when they need to be. Judd, great to have you with us today. Thanks very much for your time. It's great to be here. Thanks so much. Thank you for listening to The Ripple Effect. We hope you found this episode informative and engaging. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a review so that we can continue to bring you the best insight from the Wharton School.